Actually, we've been pretty good fast. You know? Yeah. All right. Good morning. We are in June now, June 13th, 2023. This is a birthday week for my two Gemini brothers coming up. So everybody's wow. excited about that. <laughs> the fact that they're alive is a, somewhat of a miracle. Uh, the, uh, the, the preservation of my brother Pat's liver is uh, medically going to be studied for many years by scientists how he survived. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, we are going to meditate for 20 minutes, and then I'm going to talk. I actually have what I think is a fairly interesting topic this morning that I that I got uh, inspired by an article in The Guardian I was reading yesterday, and uh, we'll see if you guys find it interesting. Um, in any case, uh, nice to see everyone. Welcome. And uh, there's a few people still coming through the uh, waiting room. Uh, oh, actually, someone was saying happy anniversary to me. So uh, actually, my my recovery anniversary is June 7th. So that was last last week. Um, I got 38 years of sobriety. It seems like kind of a, you know, 38. It's kind of a random. It's not that interesting. I'm waiting for 40 you know, to get excited, you know, <laughs> that because occasionally I can remember early in recovery, like some ra random old guy would be like 40 years and you'd be like, oh, what the hell, 40 years. Uh, so now I've become a random old guy. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> um, so uh, yeah, let's, we'll start with some sitting and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give some meditation instruction, such as it is, for a, for a bit, and then I'll leave you in silence for a bit. At least that's my general strategy. I'll, I'll try to follow that strategy. <clears throat> I may need a cough drop in my usual fashion. Um, sorry. All right, so settling into your posture, whatever that means for you, whether you're sitting on a cushion or chair or something else, you could be standing or lying down or walking. Hopefully you're not driving a car, but you can be mindful when you're driving a car, just don't close your eyes, please. And so for those of you who would like, you can close your eyes or just lower your gaze. We're trying to turn the attention inward in the metaphorical sense, feeling the body to start with. And so that can involve just Awareness of how you're holding your body, your alignment and posture. Any areas of tension or tightness that you might be able to soften. So it can be helpful to just briefly scan the body, just checking in with the different sensations, relaxing the jaw, relaxing the belly, letting the chest be open so the breath can move easily.
So we're just bringing a kind of attitude of ease, not making a great effort, but just relaxing, but paying attention as we relax. So even that can be an opportunity. What does it feel like? as you relax, noticing that sense of relief that comes when we let go of some tension. And feeling the body breathing. The breath is something that's always happening. It's always there. By tuning into it, we are tuning into the present moment. Breath that's only felt in the present moment. and feel the breath in very specific points like the nostrils or the belly. Or you can feel it as a more general movement, flow. And the breath is, is held in this larger space, space of body, space of mind. We're not trying to block out anything, but just have this very easy connection with the breath and the present moment, not striving. Thoughts may still be moving through the mind. They certainly tend to and sometimes we hop on one of those thoughts and travel for a while before we realize that we've lost touch with the breath. And then we just acknowledge that and come back. There's a, a kind of gradual settling that happens. Can't really force it. But we do need to bring a certain kind of gentle persistence. It's not passive. It's engaged. Engaged without clinging, without grasping. More like interest, curiosity. We just start with the simple interest in the breath. What does this feel like? Mm. 
And that's really enough to carry our practice. We can also step deeper in, say what, what other feelings are there, not just on the physical level. And then we might start to see other connections. What are the connections between thoughts and feelings, feelings and sensations? And here we begin to see the whole system, the mind-body system. everything connected. And the breath is our simple gateway into exploring that. It's also our our base point, the thing we always return to when, when we get lost or confused or spaced out, just come back to that simple primal experience, breathing in and breathing out.
All right. Okay, nice to sit together in, in this way that we are able to be together. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, there were a few people who were sneaking in the the back of the meditation hall during the during the meditation, but fortunately I was able to keep an eye on the door and and let them in. So um, appreciate you showing up. I know you're just trying to not have to meditate for as long. I get it. I used to do that too. Um, and just to uh, say, you know, we've been having this gathering uh, Tuesday mornings and then Friday evenings since um, March 13th of 2020. And and I've always wanted this to just be something where people could come and I've never charged for it. And and people have supported me with Donna through that time. And, and I, I really appreciate that as well. But, you know, I, one of the things I like about not charging is that then I don't have to worry if they if you don't like what I did, I don't have to worry about it. So I, I feel more relaxed and and I, I like to teach in an informal way. It's kind of how I'm most comfortable. But I did just uh, uh, start, we're starting this afternoon, a course that I've I've worked very hard to create a good course that I'm asking people to pay for, although there's still, again, uh, no no requirement. There's just a suggested donation. But uh, we, might, we might put the uh, link in there. I know some of you, a good number of you might be already enrolled in that but uh anyway um yeah it, it's just interesting this different uh vibes different feelings around teaching so um i've been i've been working somewhat with my uh buddhism 12-step workbook but uh, yesterday i got kind of uh inspired to talk about another subject today you know when you when you get into the Buddhist early teachings called the suttas, um, there's some things that are quite kind of transparent in terms of you'll read something and be like, oh, that's great. I get that. You know, be aware of the breath or, you know, be aware of your posture or your feelings or notice mind states and things that, yeah, you can sort of get, understand what they're saying. But then there are often little phrases or just te uh, little teachings that you might see them and you can kind of kind of go okay and then kind of move on and uh, but I find myself you know at times returning to some of these things and 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 sometimes something comes up that that uh, brings you back to to one of them so so this uh, topic I want to talk about today starts with um, a line from the the very first sutta, the very first teaching the Buddha gave after his enlightenment, where he you know went and found uh, after he sat under the Bodhi tree alone for for some period of time. We don't really know how long and had this kind of breakthrough in consciousness. He went looking for people to teach and remembered that there were these five other ascetics who he had been with, um, the, who he thought would be ready to hear his teaching. So he went and gave them uh, this first teaching, which is called setting in motion the wheel of the Dharma or the Dhamma. So setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, the idea that it's getting this this teaching, this is the beginning of the teaching and starting in this idea of the wheel as a traditional Buddhist symbol. And in that teaching, he he gives the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path and, and the Middle Way. So all these key kind of Buddhist teachings are right in this, this one sutta, which is really, I mean, in, in this book, it's one, two, three, four, it's like three and a half pages long, you know, but it's it's just a critical piece. But here here's the line that I'm... Uh, want to talk about today and it's the second noble truth which is he calls the origin of suffering typically we call it the cause of suffering he says 
Now this, bhikkhus, monks, is the noble truth of the origin of suffering, it is the craving which leads to renewed existence, accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delight here and there, that is, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for existence, and craving for extermination. And it's that last line that I want to talk about, craving for extermination. So in my earlier sort of first exposure to this teaching, you, I think there might be another translation. This is Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, from the Samyutta Nikaya. Um, but I remember it as craving for sensual pleasure, craving to be and craving to not be, which is even more kind of opaque than the idea of craving for extermination. And so what, what triggered me thinking about this was this article I was reading in the the Guardian yesterday, and it was actually about Russia, and and I don't want to get heavily into war, but uh, that's kind of the triggering point, and and that that at this point, and sort of going back somewhat to Russian history, and so, sort of talking about this nihilistic element of Russian culture, but but particularly manifesting in sort of right now this idea that because Russia can't keep up with the West in economic and cultural terms that they want to destroy it. Um, and, and I just made it. And, and then the, the idea that, Oh, well, Stalin and the czars and that there's always been this sort of element of sort of, and it was like Tolstoy crime and punishment. And I'm like, okay, this is over my head, but I get where you're going with this, that there's this sort of uh, a cultural element of, of, of nihilism, uh, when I'm not even sure that uh, that that's a f correct definition of nihilism, but that's a side issue. But the the point being, you know, extermination, right? That the craving for extermination, and what a strange idea that is, right? Like so. Um. So just to explore that, what that can mean for us, and maybe you know, not just in a sort of a negative way, which is kind of hard to say, well, extermination is pretty negative, but, but maybe just we can get some idea, some things out of this idea that can be insights that can be helpful for us. So that's my goal here. Um, so I guess, I mean, just to start, because this is a, recovery oriented group to see that addiction has a craving for extermination built into it right it 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 has just simply the craving to not feel what we're feeling is the craving for extermination right because just be, feeling is just the expression of life and to cut off feeling is to cut off life so i don't think that's a a stretch by any means to say that that's there is an element of the craving for extermination and certain occur, certain intoxicants and and non-intoxicants like food can all lead to this to shutting down right and and then you know the more extreme heroin or opioids really are are deadening right but alcohol as well you know blackouts <laughs> had them you know uh that's what could be more of an extermination of uh, it's it's like walk being dead you're unconscious when you're alive so so we can see that there is this impulse even though typically when we think of addiction you know and maybe this is i'll just say maybe culturally maybe even beyond the addiction world but typically people would think oh you're trying to get high right like that's kind of the the typical idea of addiction oh you're which is like it's the sensual pleasure part of it it's it's wanting to be more alive right and and there there is that element too like you get on speed and you're like i'm really alive you know or i mean, or you know hallucinogens um you know plant medicine it's like oh there's it's real aliveness but but um you know just to see that there there are these two sides to this so 
uh, I want to bring in something else just to, just to I think when we when we look at at Buddhist teachings, there's a way in which they can also incline us toward this nihilistic feeling or or impulse. Because what's the key idea of how to be free from suffering in Buddhism? It's to let go. Okay. Now, that has a, a spiritual sound to it, but if we keep taking the idea of letting go step by step to the edge of letting go, it's letting go of life. And indeed, when we look at what the, the Buddha calls Nibbana, Nirvana, it actually translates as extinguishing. So there is this kind of, you know, tone, this echo here of, you know, inclining towards death. You know, I mean, people, you know, this is like uh, when you're, when you get to, when you see what the Buddha actually said about full enlightenment, people can see it as, very life denying. He says that every time you're born, inevitably you're going to a, get older, get sick, and die. And that this cycle, the cycle of samsara, is ultimately unsatisfying. That birth and life themselves have, you know, this unsatisfactory nature. And that what we want to do is stop creating that. So if this gets misunderstood, because it's a very subtle point, it, it can be a dangerous concept if we, if, we, if we have wrong view about what this means. Because it doesn't actually mean, it's not a you know, encouraging suicide. And, and some of you have heard me recently talking about this uh, the sutta where the, where the Buddha gives a teaching on the foulness of the body, one of his topics that he gets into to help, and he teaches that to, to help monks to overcome lust, to realize, you know, these bodies that we look at and we, you know, we dress them up and we try to make them look nice and, and we get sexually aroused by other people's bodies. Then, but if you really examine the body that is this sweat and bile and liver and, and, you know, the intestines, and he goes through all the parts of the body to show that it's just, it's funny people keep showing up in the waiting room, uh, to show that, you know, if you relate to the body on this lustful level, you can get aroused by it. But if you look at it in more kind of aesthetic terms, it's actually kind of disgusting, you know? Well, I mean, that's, that's his take, right? But it's, it's, you know, it, as I say, it's with a very specific purpose. It's not like, oh, you should just always view the body as a disgusting thing, but it's, to, it's really to help the young monks to get over their lust so that they can stay celibate. So whether you think that's a good idea or not, but what happened, and this is during the time of the Buddha, apparently some of these monks misunderstood that and took it to mean really we should just die. And they either killed themselves or had someone else, someone who wasn't a Buddhist, is sort of the imp implication in the sutta, so the, who didn't believe that much in like, you know, preserving life, to have them like slice your neck, you know. Um, hor horrifying, I mean, really horrifying story, shocking story. But again, we can see how just by this slight misunderstanding of this teaching, one can go there, right? And so I, I, I think it's really intriguing to look at this and just the, the dimensions of this and really 
for our, each of us to come back to ourselves and to look at our own exterminating impulse, you know, because this is what's interesting. And this was brought up in this article in the guardian, but you know, I'm sure many of you are sort of familiar with this. This is a Freudian idea, right? The, the idea that people have a, a death wish, you know, and when you look at, you know, uh, people who are really into skulls, you know, or, uh, you know, you know, the Nazi symbols of the SS, it's very much like death, right? This obsession with death. So we can see that like, this is, this is not like some fringe idea. It's actually built into us. And it's something that we all live with is this, because, you know, human beings are the only beings we that we know of who can choose to die, right? It's quite a remarkable thing, you know, to be able to choose death. And so I think many, many humans at some point consider the idea without, you don't have to be suicidal to think, oh, well, I could just die, you know, or what if I die, you know, when, um, and so uh, this is all just sort of, uh, I just find it an interesting and maybe part of my perverse nature that I like to look into this because part of my daily practice is to do the daily contemplations in which I say to myself, I am of the nature to age, to sicken and to die. And I'm just reminding myself that I'm going to die. You know, <laughs> So, okay. So, so how can we take this so that we don't walk away from this morning all depressed, you know? Well, I, I have just noticed lately, like, just like, just take this to the more simple mood level. And you see that depression and sorrow and, painful moods are inclining toward this place as well. And that they're really calling for care. So the, so if we want to talk about maybe an antidote uh, or a, a maybe even just a skillful way to hold these feelings is first to acknowledge it's okay. It's okay to have this. This is natural. This is human. The Buddha laid this out 2,500 years ago that the, that humans have all these impulses. And we can bring love to that. We can bring care to this. And to see, you know, we are in this world of samsara, this cycle of suffering, which is just unavoidable. It's, it's difficult to be alive. It's difficult to be a human being. This is, this is, uh, it's something we didn't choose to, to be alive, as far as we know. Maybe, you know, if you, if you believe in reincarnation, yeah, you did. But but just to say, like, I don't remember choosing this. I don't remember that this was like on my bingo card, you know. But here it is, and here I am. And how can I, how can I face this? Can I see, you know, there's a part of me that like sinks into this mood. It's not that I'm suicidal, but it's kind of like, I'm not really interested in life right now, you know, or if in those kind of moods, right? Like, or this kind of sucks. And, just, and, and to say, oh, you know, that's okay. And, and there is also this access to something else called love, you know, which is maybe, you know, the, when the Buddha says the craving for existence, maybe that's, you know, the life impulse, right? Which is a love impulse to create, to, to, and, and so I just, I, th I think it's interesting to see these things that, that I guess are not often acknowledged, you know, we don't often acknowledge this and, and they're, you know, in, in polite society, it's like, crass <laughs> to bring something like this up in a way or or people will be like you know if i'm at a party or something which i try, generally avoid but sometimes i wind up in some sort of social situation where i don't know people and and uh, you know my mind I, you know i'll say something like people be like well that's just such a negative way to look at things and i'm like yes it is it is a negative way to look at things 
and it's reality. You know, it is a truth. And, and uh, you know, one of the things that I love about the recovery world is the unabashed commitment to, to truth and to see that my addiction was trying to kill me. I was trying to, I was trying to kill myself in sometimes metaphorical ways and sometimes in literal ways and almost did. And many of us almost did kill ourselves, even though we didn't think maybe we were suicidal. Although I'm sure some of you tried, uh, you know, it's very common. I, I never made any serious uh, attempts. But, um, you know, there is this impulse to see that and and to, to I guess, just to hold it with love is the, the best I can give as a, you know, as a, a positive <laughs> response to that so that we're not, we don't just dwell in, oh, God, <laughs> this terrible thing. But it did strike me, you know, in reading this article yesterday, how something like that can become a a kind of cultural identity because like we can see that American culture has a certain, you know, identity very much about individualism, but we also have this death impulse or else why would we say that everybody can have a gun and that's a good idea. You know, there's something nihilistic about that very principle in our culture. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, no, let's make it easier. Let's, let's make it easier to have more powerful guns so that you can kill more people. And, and it, it turns out just as long as I'm on this rant that, you know, the most gun deaths are suicides, right? So we're like welcoming that into, into our culture somehow through our, through our laws, you know? So what is that impulse, you know? I mean, I mean, people love to talk about how much they love life and how precious life is. And yet we have this impulse to not be alive and, and we don't entirely discourage it, you know? I would say, boy, now I, I'm really, I'm, yeah, I definitely, I don't think we should put this on, on, on YouTube. You know, this is not like one of those talks that really uh, needs to be out there. So I hope I'm not, I really hope I'm not upsetting anyone. Um, uh, you know, uh, so I'll just open it up and see if anybody wants to say anything. Uh Larry, hello. Are, Larry, are you new to our, this? Okay. I am. Yeah. Okay. This is well, I'm second. sorry you had to show up for this one. No, but... no, just the opposite. <laughs> no, no, it, it was beautiful, and I, I feel differently about it uh, than uh, because uh, just I put this thought or idea out there is um, it the you know the opportunity I think as you said in the last sit last week at this time of that when we can sit in the silence, we have a larger purview and can yeah. be one with the universe. And part of that is, well, uh, non-permanent. Yeah, right. Um, and so like my thought is, you know, that suicidal wish is maybe trying to control that it's yeah that's right just you know letting it in and accepting that's part of life yeah. so thank you yeah thank you i mean also the when we think about the universe there's this thing called entropy <laughs> in which everything is continually falling apart so yeah uh monica hi hi <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't go. get to my, <laughs> couldn't get to my, oh boy, I got a lot going, I lot, I got, a lot came up in this. Um, let's say the first thing I wanted to say was, I took notes even. <laughs> uh, I was thinking of the scorpion, story of the scorpion, that if you, if the scorpion has no other alternative, like fires around it, they'll, it'll kill itself. Wow. So, um, so why do we, so I had questions, why do we stay alive? And then I have some others. So like, <laughs> do we get craving for the negativity or 
isn't it isn't it to stay alive i'm going to try to answer my own question isn't it to be the best help be the vessel for the dharma oh Um, oh you mean why don't we commit suicide right i mean why is that oh well from a from the i mean i don't have any thoughts right so so the thing is that when you act out of any form of craving you reinforce craving and so when you when you uh, it, it, the 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 act a suicidal act is an act of aversion and it just will create more you'll you're you're going to be born again <laughs> because you you haven't let go it's quite the opposite of letting go right mm-hmm. you're actually attached right. Right. you're attached in a negative way so you're just right. and and it's really bad karma to kill anything and it's, so it's really bad karma to kill yourself so you're probably going to go to a hell realm so it's really not a good idea i mean that's again just very you know mythical or, mythical buddhist well, teaching even the, in the reincarnation part then you just come back to to do to experience the same lesson that's kind yeah. of yeah yeah and you know i mean the other thing i would say that just on on very real terms is that when you kill yourself you're you're not just killing yourself you know you're you're harming many many people and uh, and uh, you know the uh, entire circle of people that know you and and even i don't I know if you've ever you've probably heard of some of these uh, sometimes there are these outbreaks of suicides in like a high school where one kid commits suicide and then a bunch of kids stuff so it, it it's really bad it's re- it's really harmful it's a terrible thing to do to to the world you know and, and it's interesting that you know there the people who jumped off there is like I read a book about that had something about people who jumped off the uh Golden Gate Bridge and some of them survive and everyone who survived said the first thing they thought when they jumped when they were in the air was oh my god well, this is this was a mistake i shouldn't have done this so it's just it's it's an impulse that only lasts for a moment and if you get through it typically you know you're <laughs> you can get you can get over it you know it's just a temporary feeling yeah thanks it's complicated it, it is but but yeah it's it's it creates really bad karma for you and for others so that's a that's enough of a reason to me bob hello hi kevin hi everybody wow <laughs> you know i this whole subject you know i'm glad that we can talk about this that's that's the main thing yeah this is this is a taboo subject for yeah. a lot of, for a lot of things and to be able to talk about because you know when we have those feelings and i mean i'm never wanted to follow through with it but i've been very depressed about the state of the nation as i like to say in the big book you know and where is the hope you know where is you know where is all that so i get it why people you know have these feelings and stuff you know And, and for me you know i counter that with my sense of purpose as a human right um and my purpose is to be a loving and kind human right. to help other people yeah. to make beautiful music yeah. and to love my family and if i can keep that like you said i mean it's it's you affect a whole lot of people when this comes down and uh i'm just but i'm just very grateful that we can talk about this because it makes me feel and i took notes too and because it's a subject we don't often hear about yeah especially in in 12-step groups so thank you yeah, well, I don't think we hear about it in many, many groups, but because I think you put it exactly right. It's a taboo subject, and yet it's so universal, right? It's so universal, like, and, and I love that, you know, you're talking about, like, well, why do we live, right? And so this is, like, right intention, right? Uh, which, like, the Buddha is very clear. It's like, well, you should act out of kindness, and compassion and and we know it it's like you don't need it written down in a book right you don't need it to be like delivered from the dharma teacher it's like we know what makes life worthwhile it's love it's connection 
it's beauty, it's service. It's all, it's uh, quite evident to, to anyone who's, you know, found purpose, as you said, in life. We say, oh, there's, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's, it's precious. I mean, the Tibetans, when, when you study with Tibetan teachers, the first thing they always teach is how rare it is to be born as a human being. And you start mm -hmm. thinking about, oh, yeah, think about how many bugs there are. <laughs> like, you know, there, there's, there's a lot more bugs and stuff and animals and birds and everything, fish than there are humans. And then so, so that's very rare in their frame, you know, their framework of co cosmology to be born as a human. And then it's really rare to find the Dharma, or we could just say to find a spiritual path, and then to actually have the strength of character, or whatever will to motivation to follow it. And, and, you know, so I feel that way about the recovery world. We know, like, most of the people who need, who are addicts in the world are not here. <laughs> you know, they're not in recovery. We're the, we have this precious opportunity. We're so fortunate to be here. And so I guess for me, there's this thing of like, that I don't have to be afraid to talk about something that's dark and because, you know, it's, it's all part of life and, and I'm embracing all of life and, and trying to understand it all. So, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for that. Thanks. Thanks, Kat. Tanya. Hi, thanks, Kevin, and congrats on your anniversary. Oh, and thank you. Hello to all. This is really an interesting topic. Uh, back in the 80s, a friend of mine discovered some books on sub subliminal advertising mm -hmm. that were very upsetting to us because all of the subliminal imagery was about death. And what oh, sticks gosh. out in my mind is wow. one of the, and, and the book may have been written in the 60s or 70s, mm -hmm. um, you know, and one of the images that sticks out in my mind is a uh, glass of whiskey and within the ice cubes are skulls. <laughs> wow. So there's always been some sort of obsession with death in our culture. Yeah. I just think it's so interesting. But what I wanted to ask you is, can you kind of... Um, Talk about how this sort of intersects with the, the concept of no self, yeah. which can feel like kind of the same thing. Mm. Thank you. That's a, that's a really good question. And, and this is another place where kind of what I'd call wrong view of the Dharma can uh, create this misunderstanding of what that means. So, I prefer not self, but the idea is that there there is no uh, anything that you point to as yourself is not yourself. So it's not so much in in, in the Buddha it makes this pretty clear. He doesn't say there is no self. He just says anything that you think is yourself is not a self, and. So, I mean, it's kind of semantics, but so he points to body, you know, it's not yourself. And, and, and then your feelings are not yourself. Your thoughts are not yourself and et cetera. So the, so the main things are possessions are not ourselves our family are not ourselves. They don't belong to us. So the way he then makes that argument, he says, he he defines, he says something that's a self or that would belong to you is something that would have to be permanent and would bring satisfaction. And he shows that your body is impermanent and doesn't bring any satisfaction. Your feelings are impermanent and they bring no satisfaction. Your thoughts are impermanent and they bring no satisfaction. So none of them, by his definition of what would be a self or a a, a like independently existing being or thing, even thing, it can, it can't be. It it has no independence. There, everything is interrelated. Every there's nothing that's just separate and unique. So that's just 
what that teaching is. But if you take, if you misunderstand that and you think, oh, it means like I need to get rid of myself because there is this misunderstanding that, oh, Buddhism is about getting rid of yourself. Well, then the best way to get rid of yourself is to commit suicide, I guess. I mean, you know, there's still going to be, you know, residue of yourself, of you, of you having existed. But that's not what it means. The, the Buddha doesn't say you're getting rid of yourself, you know, or you have, because he says it doesn't exist in the first place. So you don't have to worry about it. Like, don't make a, don't make a problem out of it. Just see that everything that you cling to, everything that you identify as you is actually not you. It's just... Uh, these different elements that come together and and this is this is on the absolute level this is obviously on a practical level we function as selves and we have a uh, we have memory and plans and we have possessions and identification and and all of that you know we have a, a id card or a driver's license and and that's a so we have a functional self but on this absolute level which is the level at which we create suffering, <laughs> then we there is not a self. But it doesn't it it doesn't mean we should it's not annihilationism. This is like one of the things the Buddha argues against is annihilationism. I don't know if that totally answers the question, but um we're starting to run out of time. So Sherry, go ahead. Hi, Kevin. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that <clears throat> my mother committed suicide when I was about oh. 22. And I think in her yes. case, and I, I think in a lot of people's cases, life just got too hard. Yeah. And and I think, you know, she didn't have, well, I, I don't need to get into that. But, but I think what I want to say is how lucky that we are. I am. Yeah to have recovery and yeah. the teachings of your teachings and the teachings of the Buddha to stay curious about life. I mean, right now life yeah. is blah, but if I can stay curious um, and practice all these things to have less suffering, yeah. I, I just feel lucky. I just yeah. feel blessed. I'll pass. Yeah. Thank you. And, you know, I have, you know, I think it's it's in one breath at a time, and I think I put it in my workbook too. The the heading, <laughs> powerless, not helpless. And for me, that principle is really vital to this because I am powerless over sickness, old age, and death, and I'm powerless over the fact that I've got this, you know, compulsion that when I start to drink, I can't control it, but. I'm not helpless. And li yes, life has these challenges and struggles, and, and, but I'm not helpless. I can do something about it. And the, that's what the Dharma is. The Dharma is our protector. It's our refuge. And um, we just have to remember to turn to it. And you know, that's, that's the commitment. That's, that's why we're together here right now. In my mind, the most important thing about being together here right now is that it's reminding each of us to stay present, engaged, and bring all these tools of recovery and dharma to bear on the challenges that each of us might face just today or in this moment. You know, because remembering is the key thing. Um, Harry, hi. Hi, uh, I apologize. I probably shouldn't jump in because I'm so late to the conversation. I was having trouble with my internet, but uh, no, no, it's fine. Right here, um, whenever this business of uh, of, of self comes up, I I kind of want to think of it as I'm giving up some of my my own sense of identity in favor of being part of something bigger, as opposed to just dissolving myself and yeah. just like being being like a a, a worker bee if you, if, i think if you ask the worker bee 
who are you? They would say, I'm part of this hive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's almost, uh, I, I think I've, the only place I've ever seen human beings do this is in Japan, you know, where there seems to be this, nothing happens unless it's sort of a group agreement that it's going to happen. And then it just happens. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway. yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Another example of a culture that uh, has a distinct quality. You know? So um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say goodbye for now. <laughs> um, I I really, but I, I will say I really appreciate the responses from everyone today. I, I felt it, it felt a little scary as I was in the midst of talking about that, like. Uh, I don't want to trigger people and, and uh, I, as you know, was put like, this is kind of a taboo topic, but you know, one of the things that I find as a teacher is very often when I take a risk, I find out that a lot of people want to hear those things that, that are taboo or that, you know, are risky to talk about. Um, so I'm really, really grateful for you guys just being open and curious and and engaged in a, in an authentic way. So very nice. Thank you. So have a you know a joyful day. Find some joy, purpose, love to share today. Ah. Uh, I'm going to look at the chat. I think there's one or two things in the chat before I close this out. So, uh, oh, you think I should publish the video? Well, yeah, of course I will. <laughs> I'll forget. I'll forget what it was. It was just a threat. Okay. I know. Well, it was just it was me protecting myself uh, to make myself feel safe. Uh, Have a wonderful day, everybody. All right, I'm going to close out the session. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. That was Bye. awesome.